Welcome to Complexity Papers. Well, recently I was watching a video by 3Brew1Brown. And if you haven't checked him out yet, this guy puts out some fantastic content, including very good explanations of mathematics. But then this happened. Okay, and this is the part of the video where, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea how to motivate it. What 3Brew1Brown is talking about here is generating functions. And it's one of those tactics where, after the fact, you can think, okay, yeah, I get that this works, but how on earth would you have thought of that? Honestly, I don't know. There's a time in your life before you understand generating functions, and a time after, and I can't think of anything that connects them other than a leap of faith. So, and honestly, this actually fits a certain pattern. Generating function mass is said to be notoriously difficult. I remember this from personal experience. At one point, I proposed to teach this on our undergraduate degree. And my head of department said, no way you can do this. This is so difficult. But I'm of a different opinion. I think generating function mass is actually quite easy if it's explained properly. So, let's approach this from a mathematical modeling perspective. If you are a mathematical modeler, you really look at the world like this. If you see a new tool in mathematics, you wonder, what can I do with this? How does it help me to describe the real world? To get started with generating function mass, we only need the two most basic mathematical operations, addition and multiplication. Doesn't sound so complicated now, does it? Well, let's see what we can do with this. So, what happens if you write a simple equation? a plus b times c plus d. What does this equate to? Well, of course, the result is ac plus ad plus bc plus bd. This is pretty boring, isn't it? But let's put our modeler's head on and ask the question, does this equation actually model anything? Can we use this to describe the real world in some way? And of course, the answer is yes. But to see this, we have to read the multiplication as an AND. And we have to read the addition as an OR. So let's read this together. For instance, we can read this as somebody comes to you and asks, do you want an A or a B? And then somebody comes to you and asks, do you want a C or a D? So what the equation tells us is what the outcomes are after you have made your two choices. You can either end up with an A and a C, or an A and a D, or a B and a C, or a B and a D. The reason why this works is that the underlying rings have a compatible mathematical structure. A better question would be, is this actually useful for anything? So far we can only work out the outcomes of a number of different choices. And to be honest, it's not all that impressive, because multiplying out these equations is the exact same work that going through all the choices one by one would be. In a sense, what we have so far is a false victory. But in mass, such a false victory often comes just before a real breakthrough. Here the key is that some calculations can be done on the left-hand side of this equation. So we don't need to multiply out anything. So just for the fun of it, let's define this as a generating function g. Now suppose you just want to know how many different outcomes there are. In that case, you can just set all the variables to 1. So A equals 1, B equals 1, C equals 1, D equals 1, and see what happens. We straight away get the result 4. Okay, this isn't so surprising, but this is the first important rule of generating functions. If you have a function that generates some outcomes, we can always count them by setting all the variables that go into this function equal to 1. We can now also ask the question, how many of these outcomes do not contain a C? Very simple, right? We just set C to 0 instead of 1, and all the terms that contain a C will be 0. So this counts the number of outcomes 
that don't contain any seed. Let's consider a more interesting case. Suppose we can get an A or a B, and then we can get a B or 2B. How do we write 2B? Well, remember, what is 2B? 2B is a B and another B. And and, well, that is a multiplication sign now. So a B and a B is B squared. This is another important rule of generating functions. The number of copies of something appear in their exponent. In generating functions, numbers can also appear as factors in front of terms. To understand what this means, let's make an example that produces such a factor. So how about this? Do you want an A or a B? And then, additionally, do you want an A or a B? So I'm actually asking you this question. Do you want an A or a B twice? If we work this out, we find that you can get 2A or 2B, or an A and a B and a 2. This can't be right, can it? So what does a 2 stand for? It shows that we can get an A and a B in two different ways. We can pick an A on the first choice and a B on the second, or the other way around. This is the third rule of generating functions. Numbers in front of terms indicates the number of ways in which we can reach a result. So this math is particularly interesting if we are not actually making the choices, but if the choices are made for us, say, by nature. Let's go back to our original example, A or B and C or D. Now we can compute the total number of outcomes, which is still 4. And we can compute the number of outcomes without a C, which is still 2. Dividing one by the other, we see that the chance of not getting any C is one half. Not impressed yet? Well, what if I told you that the same math also works if things don't happen with equal probability? If we have unequal probabilities, we can deal with them just by sticking them in front of the respective terms. Let's try this out. So here's an example where we first get A with a probability of 40% and B with a probability of 60%. And then, independently, we get a C with a probability of 60% and two more B with a probability of 40%. Now look at this. The different terms in this equation show us exactly the number of objects that we can end up with. And the numbers in front specify the probability for each result. So if we make these choices randomly, we can now calculate the probability that we don't get a B as a result. However, what if we wanted actually the expected number of Bs that we get out of this? Well, we can do this, but there's one problem. And this problem is the counting that happens in the exponent, right? If you want the number of Bs, we somehow need to bring this exponent down. But of course, we know how to do this, right? We can just use a derivative. That's another fairly simple tool of math. So if you want to know the total number of Bs that are hidden in these outcomes, well, we just differentiate by B and then set all the variables to one. This is actually the fourth and final rule for this video. We can compute expectation values by differentiating and then setting all the variables to one. And note again that we can actually do this without multiplying out the equation. Being out here makes me wonder if I could just stay here and maybe live off catching fish or something. So let's make this our final example. So suppose in a given day I had a chance of 50% to catch a small fish. And a chance of 50% to catch a big fish. But I'm actually not so interested in the fish themselves, but in the meals that they give me. So let's represent a meal by x. And let's say a small fish gives me one meal, so x. And a big fish gives me three meals, so x to the three. We can substitute this right into the generating function. I'm now wondering how much I could catch for myself in one week. So, to go fishing seven times, all I need to do is raise this generating function to the power of seven. I could now work out the probability that I don't find any meal in this week, which in this example is fortunately zero. 
finally defines expectation value for our weekly catch. We just need to differentiate this and then set x to 1, which we can do by the chain rule without ever multiplying out the terms. So, in this case, the result is 14. So, I guess I will be fine. Of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and much more can be done with generating functions. See, we can use them to find closed forms for sequences in series. We can use them to solve very complicated problems in probability or in combinatorics. And we can even use them to study the robustness of networks against different types of attacks. And all of this only really needs the same types of operations. Multiplication, addition, and differentiation. And maybe just a tiny bit of complex numbers. I plan to put out some more content on this. But in the meantime, why don't you just watch the video by 3 blue one brown He actually uses generating functions to solve a very complicated problem in a very simple and elegant way. And that is super impressive. But before we wrap up, let me ask the most important question. Why isn't this taught in schools? Everybody tells me that this is so complicated, but it really isn't. The operations are really so simple, and actually, it helps you to apply the math that you learn anyway, like multiplication, addition, and eventually differentiation, to the real world, and actually use it. I think the reason that this is not taught in school is because schools don't teach modeling. Because if they did, this would be so simple. Hey, because you stayed to the end, I have a little bonus for you. Because I actually suspect there might be a conspiracy here. They probably told you in school that you can't add apples and oranges. But in fact, you can add an apple to an orange. And the result is just that, one apple plus one orange. And that is a useful sum, because it's models having the choice between an apple and an orange, or getting one of them with equal probability. So, see you next time for more complexity papers.